come to the announcement of the winners of the short story uh, competition. Uh, I would like to call on Brian Layden to announce the results and ask the winners to introduce their winning entries. Uh, the, the first prize winner will read their full story and the second and third prize winners uh, will introduce their story and read a short extract. Uh, Brian is no stranger to our festival. He's been here before and was very well received, so we will invite him back again. Uh, Brian is a novelist, short story writer, memoirist, screenwriter and editor. He has written extensively about his home area for RTE Sunday Miscellany. He has received numerous awards, including Francis McManus Short Story Award. He is a recipient of the Norman Mailer Writers Colonial Scholarship USA. And you can read further from his bio in the program. <coughs> Following the announcement of the winners and the readings, uh, Brian will read from his own works. Reader asks in the story, where is this and when is this? 
And I chose it too for the kind of evocation of a mindset and a way of being um, at a glorious time in life with sometimes uh, inglorious outcomes, uh, as happens in the story. Uh, for the design of happiness, the short story that took second place, which uh, is by Alex Rees Abbott, um, it poses a terrible and a very deeply moving question. How do you make better the life of a motherless child? I throw this party. And it's a story of challenge and anxiety and a kind of humble salvation at the end of it. And it was shaded just slightly by Postpartum, which is the winning short story by Lynn O'Keefe. And the first prize short story, um, it introduces us to a character in a state of what, uh, to borrow a phrase from Philip Roth, in a state of vivid transformation. Um, it's the mother in this story is alive, unlike the previous story, the mother is alive, but she's inundated, she's depressed, and she's beleaguered by a sense of her own inadequacy. And it's a story written in a blunt and kind of occasionally even overwrought sort of style, which fits the voice of the person in it. And it's really about a flight from responsibility. And I gave it first place for the way that the writer rises to the challenge set by the critic uh, Frank Kirkmore. Uh, where he speaks in the sense of an ending about endings. And we were talking about endings in the workshop. And he said, ends are only ends, he says, when they frankly transfigure the events in which they are imminent. And it's this thing about the events, something about the opening of the story, the ending, is a sense it's imminent. This is about happen. Something about this is leading to something and you get it right and it's all leading and it satisfies something that little way the story, the story and the events have been parceled together. So um, in other words what made postpartum the winning story is the way you know a seemingly inevitable um, and also uh, the inevitability of the end just still manages to surprise and turn things on our head. So, um, and in doing that, it transfigures everything that came before in the story. So, in third place, though, uh, I have, she, is she here ready to read? Yes. Sheila, we'll have you read um, an excerpt, please, from Jackson's. Sarah soon realized why Paul had been so late. 
He was clear. It was clear he was several drinks ahead. <laughs> Panicking, Sarah grabbed his hand and led him to the dance floor, where everyone was doing their own version of the twist. <laughs> Who's been practicing in front of the mirror? Paul said. But Sarah's spirit was nothing compared to his. His wiry frame rose up and down. He never missed a beat as his angular legs described geometric figures that defied gravity. A small group gathered in appreciation. For one brief moment, Sarah felt that this could be a night to remember. But too soon she realized that you cannot defy gravity as Paul lost his footing and scored on the dance floor. <laughs> Thank you. 
And uh, it's my great pleasure now, again, to uh, call on the winner of the first prize of this year's Mariah Edward Short Story Competition. Um, her name is Lynn O'Keefe and her story is Postcard. Thank you. But what if 
if she wants to talk? What if she wants to know why? I don't know what to say to her. I don't want to open it all up again. It's like pulling out stitches before a wound has healed and the blood pouring out again. Torture, messy, unnecessary, nonsensical. Mel had managed to get a phone number for a friend of mine, an old school friend. She was the friend who I'd run to in Sydney when I'd left my family all those years before. My friend told me that I have no choice now, that I have to face my daughter. I have to face them both at some point. I owe it to them. I have gotten my life back, but they have unfinished business. I brought them into the world and whether I wanted to accept it or not, they will always be a part of me. Her voice had, had, had tried to hide her anger. She had a young family too when I ran to her for support. Her mother had died young. Where her mother had been taken from her, I had chosen to take myself away from my daughters. Yet she still took me in. She never judged me, even though I abandoned my family. She stood by me while I breathed. She helped me start over again. I didn't just owe this meeting to my daughter, I owed it to my friend. It was the mother and daughter meeting that she could never have. I listened to her, I accepted it. I have to face my past. Will I tell Mel the truth about why I left? Will she even want to know? Could she cope with my selfish decision to move on with my life without them? Can I cope with it? I was a mess back then, before I escaped. My second miscarriage had set me up to be more anxious than usual. We were planning to have a baby the second time. I only realized after experience the second miscarriage that there had been a first years before. We were very young weren't ready for a baby the first time. In spite of the fact it unsettled me, the fact that I had had a miscarriage but hadn't known it. I did get pregnant not long after the second miscarriage. Then, for five years, I was either pregnant or breastfeeding. The debilitating morning sickness, broken nipples, lax bladder and distorted body of the early days was easy in comparison to the dark feelings that crept in later on down the line. Colic combined with toddler tantrums and sleep deprivation tipped me over the edge. When colic and tantrums passed, I still couldn't escape the encroaching darkness. I was never good enough. There was always something to please, but I noticed that I generally left them unpleased. I anticipated my children's need for food and play and love. I could meet their needs, especially the love, but I wasn't a natural mom. I had to work hard at it. I wished I could just enjoy it more like the other moms did. I felt guilty that I wasn't enjoying them more. My relationship with my husband had always been rock solidly evolving until we had children. After two children under the age of three, we realized that we were facing an unknown black hole. My life had stopped while his had continued. When I looked at his options, it played like a life for the taking. I felt that while his career and life progressed, mine was at a standstill, with downhill the only direction open to me. I began to resent his work trips, social trips, and complaints in general about life. Our love life had become stagnant and scarce due to exhaustion. We both had our part to play, and I internalized it as my fault. It was my job as the woman to keep the spark alive. I watched social media and magazines blast out images of all these moms returning to their better than before birth bodies. Magazine covers flaunted them lustily in front of me in their own joy. I knew that they must have been keeping their man happy. I looked more gaunt than healthy and pretty during those years. I also felt like a constant disappointment to my birth family and my in-laws. Obligations and expectations went unmet as I tried to prioritize my husband and my babies. A gesture or a visit will turn into a source of tension on both sides. Miscommunication thrived. Dysfunction ensued. It would all have been enough to drive anyone crazy. It did drive me crazy. Anxieties plagued me daily. <coughs> Panic attacks took hold at the most inconvenient times. Driving, in a queue at a grocery store, at the playground. Unhelpful comments about my anxieties and parenting plagued me. 
Can't a baby be left to cry for a few minutes anymore? Nobody died. I don't let those depressing feelings get to me. You've changed. I internalized all the comments and I believed them. My fault. To those who said them, they were just passing comments or thoughts. To me, those comments became who I was. If I was perceived as imperfect to others, then I was failing at it all. I did fail. Failed as a mother, a wife, a sibling, a daughter, an in-law, a friend. So that rainy day, 18 years ago, I made the selfish decision to leave them all behind. Block them all out. Numb myself to it all. Then she found me. I recognize her immediately. Tall and lean. As beautiful as in my catalogue of memories and imaginings. Golden hair sparkling in the Sydney sun. Every head turning as she walks into the cafe. Drawing everyone to her with her dazzling blue eyes. Just enough brain in them to cloud them and leave her mystery to all. Floating through the bustling cafe, her face searches. Her eyes land on mine. She freezes. I don't know how she knows me, but then I do I know her. We both stare for an age and then she runs to me. Her graceful movements turn erratic and clumsy. She knocks off chairs and people. Everyone's staring. Her arms throw themselves around me. I feel her face in my neck and she sobs loudly. I tentatively place my arms around her shaking shoulders. It all flashes back to me. Small pudgy arms around my neck, white faces on my cheek, snotty noses rubbing themselves clean on my shoulder, out she's rubbed away by a gentle hand, skin softer than silk, tiny toes and fingers, smiles, giggles, and early morning cuddles. Can you tell me a story, Mummy? One I've never heard before. Splashing in puddles on rainy days. Soaking with watering noses on hot summer days. Milk messes and chocolate smeared faces. Suddenly, I'm transported back to the front seat of the car in the grocery store car park. My sobbing quiets to muffles. My shoulders settle still. The pounding rain now a soft drizzle. I look in the rearview mirror and my eyes are swollen and red. The car is still running and I drive out of the car park. I turn left. I drive back home to smiling daughters and a forgiving husband. I stay. I never leave. I never leave. I never leave. I never leave. collected green shield stamps 
And when we had the right amount of books full of stamps, we sent them off with an order and got back a household gift in the post. We never got anything bigger than a toaster. But we liked to tease our postman, Jimmy Noon, saying we sent away for a wheelbarrow. <laughs> that he would have to push by hand from the post office up the side of the mountain to cross the other village. Now, Jimmy never had to contend with the wheelbarrow, but every so often an enormous brown cardboard parcel arrived that he had to balance somehow <coughs> on his bicycle. We lived over halfway up the mountain, and it was a hard push whenever a Yankee parcel <coughs> Propped on the crossbar, the cardboard sides of the parcel lost their stiffness with the moisture from his body. And Jimmy was forced to stop often to adjust his sack of letters and take off his cap to wipe the grime and the scalp oil from the leather headband. But even in the hottest weather, it was a matter of fierce pride that he wore his full uniform. The heavy navy blue trousers, the brass button jacket, the hard peaked cap like a policeman. <coughs> His old fashioned uniform conjured up associations with the early Irish Free State Army and police force, and the uniform conferred a certain authority on our postman. He could report unlicensed dogs and unlicensed bulls and unlicensed televisions, or if you had a black and white television license, even though he won't, one of the new colour sets. He could make a reliable guess at most of the business going on in a household by the number of official brown envelopes, domestic white envelopes, or foreign stamped letters that came to the post. Now, Nan, my mother, had a soft spot for Jimmy. All of the women did. He was a bachelor who said, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, when he spoke to the women. And he carried news between their houses, deaths, accidents. Whose children were off school or sick, or whose cattle were on the road. Anyone who brings news into a house brings news out of house. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy got tea from the women, bread and jam if the household was busy, or a gal tea, processed cheese, and a slice of tomato, and a slice of fresh soda bread on better days. If he had a letter for only maybe one house on the mountain, uh, he had to make do with his own sandwich, which was a bit of white bread scattered thinly with onion. He was all smiles the day he brought an American parcel into our kitchen. It made him happy to be able to present such a hefty offering to my mother, and the parcel earned him a full dinner. <laughs> you had some load on a hot day, my mother said, feeling guilty because she put him to so much trouble. I'm killed out with the heat. Well, she says, rest herself for a minute. And while she began to peel the potatoes, Jimmy stretched his legs and took his ease, his boots shining under the table and his peaked cap left on the oil cloth. They talked about the weather, and Jimmy said he met a Mrs. Gaffney the other day running with a bottle of holy water in her fist to sprinkle on the roof of the hen house as the storm was rising. He watched her splash holy water on the loose sheets of iron being lifted by the gale, and when she finished, he said, Would you like me to throw a rope on that as well, man? <laughs> Just in case the holy water doesn't work. <laughs> After the hour, he glanced at his watch. He was on overtime now for the delivery of the parcel, and he fitted the metal bars of a juice harp between his front teeth and began to twang out tune. We had to wait until Jimmy left before we could rip open the parcel. The softened carver tore easily, and the delay caused by the fortified bands of brown tape only added to the anticipation. On top, there was a note from my mother, and then the dresses, the frocks, and the skirts, and dime bars made from American chocolate with a mysterious, almost unpleasant flavour that harmonised with the smell of the clothes, a blend of exotic fabrics, camphor mothballs, and ozone after the parcel's slow sea passage. Some of the clothes from America we could wear, like the t-shirts and the jeans, but even 
the jeans were a funny shape, and the dresses for my mother were so gaudy she would never dare to be seen out in them, and the men's jackets for my father were loud enough to frighten the cat. <laughs> Instead, the garden path became a catwalk where we strutted in the American sequined gowns and the high heels and the extravagant hats and twirled and pouted in the costume jewellery for our own amusement. We also gave out the big suits and pretended we were our uncle saying, God damn, somebody ought to do something in the bonds. And we loved to dress up. And you might think that we were ungrateful for the suits that perfectly fitted those barber shop groomed men on the sunny sidewalks and broad avenues of America. The Spaniards, the taffeta, the gaudy fabrics of the women dresses looked ridiculous in any other setting. Ireland wasn't ready yet for the brash individuality of these cast -offs. And though we were always on hand when a parcel from America was opened, we never noticed what came for Matt and Nan, my parents, under the lurid camouflage. Contraceptives. <laughs> Forbidden by law in the Irish Free State, they came hidden in the American fashion magazine at the bottom of the parcel. And never once in all those years did our postman in his state issue blue uniform, suspect the kind of content he was employed to carry into our house while he smiled and waited for the spuds to go. This is a tiny thing called the proposal from Sweet Old World. It's about a neighbour of ours, Johnny. He was a bachelor. He was a coal miner in Arigna. And one of these small time cattle dealers, not a cattle, not a farmer, which was lower in rank because he didn't own land. He would have been a bit of a tangler. Uh, he could be rough, uncouth, blunt, but he always spoke his mind. And for a while, he went out with a local girl called Mary Reynolds. <laughs> daughter's hand in marriage. The father didn't want Johnny next nor near his precious only daughter. And he turned down Johnny's proposal saying, the man that marries my daughter will be decent, clean, honest, sober, hardworking, have land of his own and money in the bank. <laughs> I understand, said Johnny, you want her to do better than her mother. <laughs> I love those that just reduce it. Um, this is slightly longer that I finish with this piece. Um, it's from a new novel called Summer of 63. And when I was reading Sheila's story, I was so there because I'd done my research. Um, Summer of 63 is the summer, of course, that John F. Kennedy comes to Ireland. And it's not that he features much in the novel at all, although I was intrigued, uh, she, I did dig up an old evening herald with the, the photos from just around that time, 63, 6, of uh, when Kennedy was in the country. I use it as a device for, and this is, I suppose, if you're writers and you're interested in writing novels about your own area, it's a useful thing to do is to actually parachute a stranger into the place you come from. So they're seeing it with new eyes and it's legitimate to describe the place because it's all new to them. So what's familiar to you is not familiar to your main character. So the main character here is a young boy, Leo Rossiter. He's an asthmatic young only son. Uh, his parents have moved in to manage the shop and pub. His mother is a huge fan and has done up the new lounge, what she calls the American lounge, with flags and plates of the inauguration for the Kennedys and the flags flying. And actually with this new American lounge, she's built specially, which is the television company. That was the first big RTV rental surge when the president was in town. And she has the American flags flying. But the flat roof 
is a brilliant spot for the, the romantic interest for Niece Hickey, uh, who is a bit older than the boy, but of course he has a crush on her now at this stage. And um, she uses the flat roof as a private place, as a sun trap to sunbathe. So this is summer of 63. When my parents left in a Scorpio to come to Arigna, to run the pub and shop and the guest house combined, that belonged to the colliery owners, Bernice Hickey already lived on the premises. Her job included accommodation, so you could say she came with business. And while no one ever said to me straight out she was alone in the world, I'd noticed how she never had people belonging to her visit. She got no letters or cards, and she never went anywhere. She'd come straight from an industrial school to take up a job in the village shop. Now, being an only child, I couldn't imagine what it must be like to have no father or mother watching you like a hawk. In the past couple of months, Bernice had started to wear her skirts and her hair shorter than normal. Plus, she had my mother demented, playing the same Beatles song over and over since the long playing record, Please Please Me, came out in March. Daddy, who only ever listened to Jim Reeves, warned Mammy to say nothing. Her niece was a bright and capable girl, he said, and she didn't have much around here to keep her entertained. Deep down, her niece had to know she was really good-looking, but she didn't socialise much and she didn't have a boyfriend. Without letting her know I was there on the roof, I watched as she stirred in the deck chair and raised one of her slim, pale legs to see if she was getting <coughs> colour. I felt that uncomfortable tingle at the bottom of my lungs start again, caused this time by the smell of tar underfoot rising from the hot felt roof. Her short, dark hair was held in place with a headband, and as Bernice leaned forward, my interest moved from her raised leg to the pale delicacy of her neck. And the way that her loud, sorry, and the way that her chin rested on her chest, where the rise of her breast started, below the necklace of her sleeveless white top. When I let the air in my lungs escape, I heard a low asthmatic rattle. I tried to tell myself I wasn't interested in Bernice in a sleazy, wheezy way, but seeing how her candy striped shorts and tight fitting top displayed her womanly figure to full advantage, my curiosity boiled over like a small saucepan full of milk. Bernice was thirsty and looked hot, and it made me happy to be able to display the bottles of Fanta I lifted from the shop as I approached. I got you a mineral. Called out. Did you pay for those? <laughs> I called it and said, I can put them back if you like. No, she says, I'll set it up for them later. Have you an opener? And I got out the opener with a pocket knife, and in one, it had one little short blade and one long blade, and I'd hold the long blade devilishly sharp with a wheat stone from the shop, and beside the small blade was a hook for catching the edge of caps and bottles. I then flipped off the two mineral bottle caps without spilling a drop and handed her the drink across to her knees and proudly put away the pocket knife. We were both thirsty and the Fanta was tangy and sweet. What had been a clear day, however, was now growing darker and in the direction of Drumshambo, the muddy orange-coloured sky above the town was full of low booms and rumbles. There was not a breath of air to stir the American flag on its pole on the roof, and the rumbles were getting louder, and I kept a tight eye on the clouds where they were darkest, and I reckoned I'd soon see a flash of lightning. Come away from there, her niece said. Come right back from the edge. You're making me nervous. I said, well, look, if you're nervous of heights, I said, you have to push yourself and fight back against the fear. That's what I do when I get wheezy and asthmatic. I run against the hill until the attack goes away. She said, I'm happy how I am. And she finished her mineral, but I went back to watching the storm grew. The sky was now as purple as the outfit worn by the phantom in the Ghost Who Walks jungle comic books. And out of the corner of my eye, I glimpsed a bright bolt of lightning. After several seconds, the boom came like the sound of a 20-gallon iron tar barrel being rolled across the covered hills, and more low booms echoed from the mountain slopes behind us. Ever since the Cuban Missile Crisis last October, 
The world stood on the brink of all that nuclear war. And Kevin dreams about atom bombs exploding. A fantastic, bright detonation behind the mountain overlooking the village, followed by a giant mushroom-shaped cloud swelling to fill the entire sky as I waited for the shockwave to hit. But I woke up every time an instant before the atom bomb blast struck and reduced me to a scorch mark on the outside wall of a pub, as though incinerated by an almighty bolt of lightning. Quick as a wink, a fork of lightning did streak across the heavens, directly overhead. Wow! I said, did you see that? Bernice was already out of her deck chair and on her bare feet, gathering up her belongings to get off the roof. I moved to collect the metal and canvas deck chair. I was nervous about how to fold it properly, but it was light and easy to manage. And I was happy to follow her niece as she hurried towards her bedroom window with the lace curtains and started to flutter. We made it into the room ahead of the rain, but as I turned around to fix the curtains, I saw another fork of lightning strike downwards out of the clouds. I lowered and fastened the bottom half of the window just as the crack of thunder reached us. Bernice said, come away from the window. I moved deeper into the bedroom. She had a poster up on the wall of the Beatles looking cheeky with their mop top haircuts and smart suits. And under the poster, her niece had the Pi record player with the top open and the Beatles single on the turntable set to play at 45 RPM. And just as I thought, the arm of the record player was lifted across and it would be playing again now when a ball of fluff had built up onto the needle and the stylus just slithered across the vinyl and got stuck at the end, making only a clicking sound. Bernice stopped the record and then draped the towel over the bedspread and sat on the edge. See that brown bottle on the dressing table? She said, can you pass it over to me? Outside, the thunderstorm was close enough for the noise to vibrate the single pane of glass in the window, where the putty had crumbled and fallen out. I gave Bernice the brown bottle, and she uncapped it and poured milky pink calamine lotion into her hand. Next, she got hold of the bottle, and while she rubbed the lotion in to one fore forearm, I looked at where her skin was red and hot. And then she used her other hand to take off the extra lotion and rub it into the opposite arm where it too looked tender. And I stood close and poured more of the lotion into her hands, which she rubbed on her legs and asked, How's my neck? Kind of red too, I said. <laughs> Bang, the thunder again and began to repel the rain against the windows and down the flat roof, making puddles straight away. And she opened the top button of her sleeveless blouse and pulled the collar open. My face felt hotter than any part of her sunburned skin. <laughs> Can I put some lotion on the back of my neck, she said. I tipped the bottle gently to pour a small amount of the calamine lotion into my hand. And I laid my hand on her warm neck and gently worked the lotion into the skin. And she moved her head around and I could sense the pleasure it gave her to have her neck and shoulders rubbed. The room itself had grown hot and airless. And I was afraid I was going to start wheezing again. But the calamine lotion smelled lovely. And the perfume heat from her, her niece's skin didn't affect my asthma one bit. <laughs> she opened up another button and I managed and I massaged her lower neck. That feels good, she said. The rain now swirled outside the windows in full force of the storm struck, but it was so dim and snug and cosy in Bernice's room, it felt like we were cut off from the rest of the world. And I wondered how far I could take this. When a really bright flash of light lit up the whole room, a brilliant blue white. Ready to count off the seconds in my head between the flash and the thunder, I barely got past one before we heard an incredible bang. Bernice flinched, and I increased the pressure of my hands on her shoulders to reassure her, and a burst of hailstones beat against the window. It's all right, I said. We're safe here. And she reached up, and she put her hand on mine and began to draw me closer. I was ready to ease back onto the bed alongside her when the next violent crack of thunder exploded with a monstrous bang, as if the sky overhead had just been split open by an almighty sledgehammer. Bernice slid out of my grasp, down on her knees, on the rug, on the floor.
floor, and the whole room lit up again with another cannonade, and she said, Hail Mary, full of grace, <laughs> the Lord is with thee. And I had to take up the prayer as Holy Mary. <laughs> Bernice winced at the next lightning flash and the shot of thunder, but kept up the prayers. And I felt like telling her that it would be better to let go of my hand and make me stand safely back. If God intended to strike down anyone with the next bolt of lightning in this overheated summer downpour dark bedroom, <coughs> it was bound to be me, the sneaky, wheezy best friend, holding her hand who should be fried alive by heaven's highest voltage for the secret thoughts and longings going on inside my head that I could not mention on pain of death. <laughs> Uh, for allowing us to bring visitors to the historic sites here in Edgerton. 